Good morning, LCM. Good morning. Today is a victorious day for the body of Christ. Yeah. We are part of the church of the eternal and living God. It is Sunday, February 16th, 2020, and the title of today's message is War Cry. A War Cry. Hey, saints. I am LCM from the fraternal and eternal order of the DCD. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am on the offensive for Jesus Christ. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down, back away, or be still. My losses are redeemed. My present is to make war my victory secure. Church, I am finished and done with low living. Sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, cowardly ambitions, faint-hearted faith, and feckless objectives. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I now live by presence, lean by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power unto the ultimate sovereignty of God. Church, my pace is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions few. My guide reliable. And my mission paramount. Church, I cannot be bought compromise, deterred, intimidated, turned back, deluded, or even delayed. Come on, I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. Hesitate in the presence of adversity. Negotiate at the table of the enemy. Ponder at the pool of popularity. Or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I'm on a war path for Christ Jesus. Come on. I must give until I drop. Preach until all know. And proclaim until all are empowered. And when my time is up, He will have no problem recognizing me. Church, I am LCM from the fraternal and eternal order of the DCD. I am not ashamed to fight for the gospel of Christ. Come on, church, turn with us to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 3. Come on, are you DCD in this place today? Yes! Exodus chapter 15 and verse 3. It says this. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. See, we're defining the characteristics of the God that we serve. He is a man at war. He is a God of war. His name is Yahweh, Yehovah, whatever it is that we can say about this name that is above every name. The I am that I am. He is self-existent and he is here to make war on the enemy. You hear that saints? He is here to make what? War. Revelation 19.11 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. His rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. You know the comfort, confidence, and encouragement that we get is that the King of Kings that is leading us is leading us into war and leading us by the two monikers of Faithful and True. Does it comfort you that you have a king that is faithful? Does it comfort you that you have a king that is true? It's through his justice that he judges. That means what he puts his hand to, it is right. The judgments that he makes are correct, righteous, and true. And it's through that justice that he is able to make war. We are going to join that rider in making war. Come on. Let's all turn to Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18. And we're going to begin at verse 9. Come on, give us a war cry when you get there. Yeah. Come on, it's coming alive. Say say war cry. Yes. Psalm 18 verse 9 says this. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Oh, Lord, that you would, in fact, rend the heavens and come down to us today. Can you feel that that's what he's wanting to do? Church, we had a prophecy in tongues today. We had two interpretations that were so excited we almost did them on top of each other. But we got ourselves in order. We worked through that. 
We had another brother who had a scripture and we had an elder's wife who came forward and concluded the matter. <laughs> That's five things in a row. That was God ringing the heavens and come down to grab us today and help us and pull us up and strengthen us with his mighty right arm. See, what a uniform that we're seeing here. See, we're not talking about having combat boots on. He had dark clouds under his feet. Oh, yeah. He's not talking about a jeep or a horse or a tank. What he had were the angels that he was riding upon. We're not talking about a helicopter or a plane, but he was soaring on the wings of the wind. We have a God, a warrior God, whose outer covering, his jacket is made of darkness. I'm sure that's rather slimming, right? <laughs> His outer garment is the darkness that other people are afraid of. He says, yeah, I got that on like a jacket. This is the God that we serve today. Oh. So he's in verse 12. It starts to even paint a clearer picture. Out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advance. For well, the God of war does not need camouflage. He does not need a ghillie suit in order to hide in the bushes and snipe from a mile and a half away. The God of war advances with the brightness of his presence. Yes. It's what goes before him. It announces, I am coming to war because I'm coming to get victory. With hailstones and bolts of lightning, the Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. When the word of God goes forth from the God of war, it lets all of his enemies know, I am coming for you. I am going to destroy you. Verse 14 says, he shot his arrows and scattered the enemy's great bolts of lightning and routed them. The God of war will hit his target. I mean, he's not only thunderous. He's not only brilliant and bright in his presence. He's a pretty good aim. And from the heavens, he launches his arrows and it decimates it destroys, it scatters, it puts asunder everyone who is an enemy of God. Come on, let's look at Exodus 17 and verse 15. Exodus 17 and 15. It says this, Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, for hands were lifted up to the throne. Come on, lift your hands up for me for a minute. For hands were lifted up to the throne. The Lord will be at war. Come on, say at war. And war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. The God of war is at war. This should not be a surprise to those of us in this room. The eternal God is at war from generation to generation to generation. We talked about this on Wednesday night. We say that we know that we are in a battle. We say that we know that we are at war, but we live more like civilians than we do those being empowered by the God of war. See, he is bringing everything back into shalom. Yeah. He is going to put it in yeah. the right order. And our job is to raise our hands to the heaven and understand that he will empower us as he does it. Yeah. Church, are you going to raise a war cry with us this morning? Yeah. Well, Zechariah 14, 3 says, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations. What must that look like? A couple months ago. I illustrated with a very brisk walk as a father would pace to his child who is being rebellious. And I think Justin Linton cringed with fear over there in the corner. He had never seen that pace or walk or my face at any point in time in the past. Oh man, if we tremble at the sight of our father approaching to discipline us, how much more will people tremble before the living God when they are his enemies? We have a God that will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. The God of war is at war and he's going out to fight. And he's fighting for his right order. He's fighting for his shalom because his, he wants his name, his kingdom to fill the earth. 1 John 3, 7 says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous. Thank you, Elder John, for making this so clear to us. When you do what is right, you're righteous, just as he is righteous. Our yeah. God of war is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Thank you again, Elder John. That's plain. Yeah. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared. You ready for this? Yeah. See, you thought it was just to save you from your sins. That's what modern Christianity teaches you. The reason he's here is to somehow only help me. 
Yes, he's going to help you, but the way he does that is to destroy the devil's work. See, that's why he's here, is to make war against the parts of this world that are not submitted to him. He will bring all things under his control. That is the reason. Somebody say reason. Reason. The reason he is here is to make war against the devil. Come on now. Everybody turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Say war cry when you're there. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy. Come on, say it loud. Yeah, that's better than coffee right there. <laughs> Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. Let me look on the screen, make sure it matches. Okay. If you perhaps might possibly go to war. No, what is that first word? Yes. When you go to war. See, there is a certainty. That because the God that we serve is a God at war, therefore the people of God will also be at war. When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, right? That's a very visible fact that's present. An army greater than yours. Do not be afraid. Well, what the Lord has been saying to us over and over and over through all these messages, what we're learning in Foundations on Monday night is do not be afraid. Why is that? Because the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. Come on, when we begin to consecrate our hearts, cultivate our soil, purify our priesthood, then begin to stand in the right division, the positions that God has put us in, it now puts us in alignment with God's will and thereby God's war. Saints, are you working to consecrate and cultivate your hearts? Are you working to stand in the right divisions that he has placed you in? Well, get ready for war. Because we are aligned and following the God of war. And wars are made up of battles. War is the big picture. War, war is the whole enchilada. War is where we're going for the entirety of our lives and to bring shalom in our homes and through the generations. Verse 2 says something different. When you are about to go into battle. Come on. See, it's one thing to know that you're in the war, but you've got to forget where the next battle is. The priest shall come forward and address the army. Come on, priests who need to come forward and address the army. Well, it, it doesn't say the military commanders. It doesn't say the soldiers should now come forward and address the army. It says that the men who represent God himself, because our God is a God at war, a God of yes. war, send the priest out there and let them address this, the army. And what shall they say? They shall say, hear, O Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Somebody say your enemies. Your enemies. See, we know, church, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. No. It's not the problem with the people who are sitting next to you. It's against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evils in the heavenly realm. This is what we must fight against. Our enemies, do not be faint-hearted or afraid. It's amazing that when you actually are supposed to get into war and supposed to get in the battle, the Lord keeps saying, hey, don't be afraid. Don't you look at your circumstances and be afraid. Stop being afraid. Don't be faint-hearted. Why? Pastor just said it. Because God is with you. Yeah. If He is with you, how can you tremble? Do not be faint-hearted. Do not be afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. Mm. But Pastor, you don't understand how difficult this is. Yeah, I understand that we are not waging war the way that the world does. See, our weapons, the weapons that we have, they are mighty. And they will, in fact, penetrate the darkness. They will, in fact, defeat the enemy. They will, in fact, pull down the strongholds there because our God is with us. Amen. Come on, church. we got to rise up and have a war cry in our spirit yes. today. Verse 4 makes this very plain. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. Say with you, church. With you. To fight for you. Say for you. For you. Against your enemies to give you victory. Say victory. Victory. Oh, this is so much greater than the schoolyard fight with a bully. Right? Those of you who had older brothers, older cousins, 
that would show up on the elementary school ground. They were in middle school or high school. And as the bully would begin to push you around, taunt you, maybe even begin to knock you over into the dirt. All of a sudden, that older brother, the older cousin steps on the schoolyard. What happens to your confidence? Like, it's on now. Hey, I'm not alone. Hey, Pastor, I don't think that's just on the schoolyard. I think you just described the entire Rosales clan. That's exactly right, man. You get one, and you're like, man, I might be able to take that dude. And then a bigger one shows up, and you're like, oh. Wow. And then a bigger one. They get taller. And then they get to, like, Viking size. And then we're at the phylum size. We're like, how do they keep getting bigger and stronger? Wow. It's the Rosales clan. That's, that's what I'm thinking of right here. It's all of use over there. All of use, guys. All of use. Y-O-U-S. Forget about it. It's over here. Forget about it. Oh, so if it's on. like that. Come on, Pastor. Come when, on. Yeah, come on, man. Come on, Pastor. Yeah! Yes! Hey, at least the Rosales can ain't got a war cry. <laughs> They're on our team. We exactly. Like <laughs> yes. Mighty fighting men. That's right. If that's the case in the natural. Come on, we need to open our eyes this morning and raise a war cry. That we have the God of all heavens standing with us because we're standing with him. Not only is he standing next to us, he is going to fight for us. The goal is victory, not defeat. Are y'all ready to win this morning? Let's get it. Come on, let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. We are going to see something incredible here in this passage. Come on, say war cry when you get there. See, we have to anticipate. We have to expect we have to plan on there being a war and battles that yeah. we must be in. Not just in our words, but we got to have the attitude that says, not only do I understand that there's a fight, I'm ready for it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I want to put this enemy underfoot, and you can't do that by staying in your bunker. you got to get out there, yeah. and you got to fight some hand-to-hand -hand combat. Look at verse 1 of Second Chronicles 32. After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done wow. yeah come on somebody say faithfully done faithfully done see this is actually a continuation from where we left off on wednesday night with hezekiah hezekiah had consecrated the temple he had consecrated the priest he had consecrated the people he had reinstituted the passover with great rejoicing they even got it right finally on the second set of seven days he assigned the priests and levites to their divisions he was putting everything in order. The next verse, after he puts the priests in order and they're celebrating that God had done this great thing, the next verse is verse 1 of Second Chronicles 32. After all that, after he was elevating his priesthood, after he was cultivating the soil of his heart, after he had gotten his life, his family, his home in order, after he had everything that he had so faithfully done, He ran into a battle. Mm. See, other translations say here that he had so faithfully done that there were acts of faithfulness. I, I, I like it. I like that. But when you actually look at the words in the Hebrew, there are two words. After all that Hezekiah, word and truth. Yeah. Word and truth. Word and and truth. What did Hezekiah do? He did word and truth. He was so committed to this that everything that we're talking about, the consecration, was because he had the word and he was working in the truth. He was walking in the word. He was walking in the truth. He was fighting with the word. He was fighting with truth. After all that he had done and gotten really, 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 really good at that. Man, this is just like the, the scripture that Pastor read about the Lord, our great warrior king, who is riding on a white horse and his name is Faithful and true. He had the word yeah. and he had truth here and yeah. he put them together and it showed a victorious nature. And he now engaged in battle. Yeah. See, we've got to let go of the idea that when you get into battle, there's something that was wrong about your life, that this is somehow unfair. It's somehow unjust. Golly, I was doing everything right. How would this thing, why would that person say something against me? Because you're at war. But, but I was really trying to do this right. Yeah, you're at war. 
You go, you're just entering, now you know where the next battle is, and you just stepped into a battle. You can't be surprised when the battle's there because you are at war. Our God is at war, and we must reflect him. Let's continue on with verse 1. Sinasherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. But what begins to happen when you are cultivating the soil of your heart? You're consecrating, purifying your priesthood. You're then stepping boldly, confidently, and by faith into the division, the place that God has put you. You are now a threat to the enemy. You are now able to take possession and hold the ground of inheritance that God has given you. And when the devil sees that, he's coming to take it. Try and take it. He begins to surround you and intimidate you. That I have conquered all these areas around you and I just want this for myself. Because he is at war with God. Therefore, he's at war with God's people. What I see in this process of Hezekiah consecrating the nation of Israel, preparing them by putting in them in their divisions, is that God, through Hezekiah, was preparing them for this very moment. He was preparing them for war. War is always made as a result of confronting fleshly desires. I'm talking about that selfish ambition, envious spirits and hearts. Well, what begins to happen whenever you're walking holy, Pastor? What begins to happen when you are acting in confidence in who God made you as the man or woman that he, he designed you to be? You become intimidating to all those who are opposing God. And you are a threat, and rightfully so. We should find confidence, just like what Pastor said. We should find confidence that not not proclaiming what is wrong with me, it's because what is right with me that I am being opposed and finding war on my doorstep. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, Pastor's talking about you. Turn to your, uh, the other neighbor that you didn't want to talk to that time and say, man, you're looking dangerous. Mm. Cassie, you're looking dangerous this morning, baby. <laughs> wrong, wrong type of battle, Pastor. Here we go. Verse 2. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem. Boy, it's one thing to see an enemy. It's another thing when you actually realize, oh, we're about to fight. Yeah. Now, I know some of you guys never had that experience in life. You've walked through. People like Justin Treister have just been so gentle his whole life. He's never, ever thought about being in a fight before. Those, Robo those Rosales dog pound there, they've never thought about these things. But it's one thing when you think you can talk your way out, and it's another thing when you realize, no, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. This person intends to obstruct me in every possible way. Let's do this. It is on. See, they realize that the enemy intended to make war on them. you got to realize something, church. The enemy intends to make war against you. Yeah. He intends to come in and steal from you, to kill you, and try to destroy your family. Yep. See, it's not just isolated. Your thoughts, the events of your workplace, what's going on in your home, what's going on is there's an enemy that is trying to kill you. He's trying to make war against you. Look at verse 3. He consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. What was the first thing that Hezekiah did when he realized that there was a war? He went and he found brothers. He went yeah. and found people in a jarhead covenant. He went and yeah. found people around him to say, you know what? I think I'm in a battle. Hey, I need you to make sure that, that I don't have any blind spots. I need you to help me. I need you to point it out to me, Leslie. I need your help in my life. Come on, show. I need you. Yeah. I need you because I'm at war. I need you to stand up with me, Carlos. Come on, this is what's going on here. Verse 4. A large, a large force of men assembled, and they blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria and come and find plenty of water, they said. All right, now we've got to get a little strategic here. Yeah. They did not want the enemy to come in and be well supplied from the provision that God's people were supposed to have. 
you're not quite getting it with me yet. See, you can't keep feeding the enemy on the things that God gave to you. See, you can't make it easy on the enemy that is trying to overcome and defeat you. See, you can't just give him ground. You can't just go, well, I'm just mad today. I, I blew up. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Yeah. You run back to the word and you say, no, I'm not going to allow any room. I'm going to keep elevating my priesthood. I'm going to keep cultivating my soul that the enemy is not going to get any freebies from me. No free days where I'm just too afraid to go out and do what I'm supposed to do. No days where laziness overcomes me, where, where tiredness overwhelms me, where offenses start working on me. See, the enemy has a portal through into your heart when you allow offense, when you allow anger, when you allow these different things and you don't rightly seal them off. Come on. See, this is what God's people did here. Hezekiah, there's, there's a thing in, in Jerusalem called Hezekiah's Tunnels. He cut tunnels to make sure that the people of God got the water, but that the enemy didn't. See, you got to put some work in to closing off those areas where the enemy keeps getting in. And he, the enemy is able to stay sustained through what you're giving him. Come on, there's a time for us today, church. We're going to have a war cry. We're going to close off of those areas so that God can be victorious. Let's take a look at verse 5. I'll tell you what, Pastor, you know where we're going to cut off? We're going to cut off. What is feeding the frenzy of our fears? Come on now. Pastor talked about offenses. He talked about selfish ambition. We need to cut off those waters that we are allowing to flow and feed our fear while we're trying to stand firm and go to war. Come on. Well, one of the greatest things that you can do to immediately become victorious is deny your mind and heart from being fed by fear. We've heard over and over again in these scriptures, do not be afraid. Do not panic. Do not be terrified. When we begin to raise a war cry, you know what we're doing? We're cutting off those waters that are feeding our fear. When we're raising a war cry, we're cutting off the desire for selfish ambition, pride, and offense. We're saying we're dead to ourselves. We will only be fed by the waters of heaven, and my flesh will have no access to it. Amen. We have to cut it off. Verse 5, then he worked hard repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. Oh man, this council of righteous men began to lay down a strategy to defeat the enemy. And once it turned from cutting off feeding the enemy, it turned into fortifying the people of God. Amen. You know what begins to happen when we see the enemy approaching our gates? We all start evaluating our own households. What areas of the walls of fortification in my home, the areas of shalom that I have with my wife and my children, my brothers, do I need to start putting back together? Because I don't want any weakness to be present that gives the enemy an ounce of advantage in breaching the walls of my shalom and destroying me and my family. I want to win in the name of Jesus. On top of that, I'm not only going to build or, or re repair the walls, I'm going to build towers. I'm going to elevate my priesthood that elevates my awareness of what's going on. That is able to have a storehouse, a provision, while a siege is on its way. Because I am planning for victory. And I will outlast and I will outmaneuver the enemy. It continues. He built another wall outside that one. And reinforced the supporting terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. We begin to build that extra wall. That's additional fortification. That's not only right here within my home. That's now going to reach out to those that God has put me next to, people within LCM. I'm going to make sure I have a fortification in all relationships that God has put in my life. I'm going to make sure there is not an easy path for the enemy to run and try to take over the shalom in my home. In addition to that, said he also made a large number of weapons and shields. You know what we're doing this morning? We're fashioning some weapons. We're putting together some shields. That word weapons actually means a missile. It is a spear or a, like, a projectile object designed for war. Oh, man, we are assembling 
words from the heavens that give us an armament that can go beyond the walls of our homes in this church and can hit its target, destroying the enemy's work. In addition to that, we have a magen, a, a, a shield that is able to absorb and extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. Because when you go to war is the promise that we have. So what do we need? We need that shield of faith that is raised up, that is protecting our hearts, protecting our homes, protecting our shalom, and will absorb and extinguish every fiery dart that's aimed at it. Church, are you hearing this? We don't have these kind of situations in our current world, so you have to think just a little bit. You're, you're repairing the broken parts of the wall. That's you getting your family in the right order and right shalom. Then, then you're reestablishing towers. You're elevating your perspective. You're remembering that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. You're getting above the situations yeah. and the low living and the low thinking. And you're building another wall. But you know what those are? Those are all defensive type measures. Man, if the enemy gets close, I better have repaired this wall. Yes, that's true. But then you need to have the weapons that are being launched out. It's not just that we're asking you today to be on your defensive posture. We're saying not only should the defensive posture be taken care of, but you should go on the offense that the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Why? Because you're kicking them down. This is what we're talking about. Look at verse 6. He appointed military officers over the people. Man, oh man. Military officers. You know the way it says this in different translations? He appointed captains of war. See, these aren't just, these aren't just guys that they were like, well, well, guess we'll use you. They're getting experienced, battle-hardened, savvy men who understand what war is about. And they are elevated in these moments to help the larger group of people. You know what we're trying to do here at LCM? We're trying to appoint captains of war. Yes. This is what we are trying to do is raise up men who have the experience of war, who understand what it's like to fight and win, who understand the difficulties and the necessities of it, and they're able to go forward. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them uh, before him in the square at the city gate, and he encouraged them with these words. Everybody say encouraged. Encouraged. You know what the words behind that phrase that he encouraged? It says that he spoke to their hearts. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like being encouraged when the Lord begins to speak to your heart. When the word of God pierces all the fear, the fear that you have, it pierces the offense and you go, man, you just spoke to my heart. And that is in the most encouragement that you can get. You don't need a pat on the back. You need someone who will speak a word to your heart. You don't just need an attaboy. You need something that, somebody that has a word that speaks into your heart. Let's look at verse 7. Church, say, speak to my heart, please. Speak to my heart, please. Hear the words that Hezekiah said, speaking to their heart. Be strong and courageous. Rakazak ve'amat. Isn't that right, Ohad? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. That's an acknowledgement of a fact, right? Yes. Oh, but that's not all of the story. There's something even greater. For there is a greater power with us than with him. What is speaking to their hearts, what is speaking to our hearts, is though the fact may be there is a vast army. There is a vast obstacle, a vast threat, that we have a God who is greater. What? Is Jesus raised from the dead? Yes. Has he raised you from the dead? Yes. Out of the mastery of sin and now at war with sin. Yes. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us. Say with us, church. With us. With us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence. Yeah. Oh, how many people in this room need some confidence this morning? Man. Right here. We're gaining confidence from this very short word that Hezekiah gave to speak to the people's hearts. <laughs> We're gaining that confidence because we are fixing our eyes on the one who is greater and with us than with them. Let's talk about that greater power that's with us. Turn to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 6. 
Come on, Exodus 15 and verse 6, you know this. This is the, the war cry, the song of Moses himself. Exodus 15 and verse 6 says this, Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. He's not playing pity pat with the enemy. He shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down on those who opposed you. I love that. I love that that phrase is in the Bible. In your greatness of your majesty, you threw down on those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. He consumed them like stubble. See, when you are standing with God, He is able to stand with you. Yes. And when He is with you, He's going to help you. He's going to fight for you. He's going to fight through you. He's going to fight with you. Because there is a greater power with us when we are standing with Him than you could possibly imagine. There is no enemy that can stand up to the power of His right hand. Yes. They're going to get crushed. They're going to get shattered. He's going to throw down on them. <laughs> There is a greater power with us as we stand with him. Oh, uh, turn to Joshua chapter 10. Say war cry when you get there. We're going to throw down this morning. Verse 12 and 13. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O oh, sun, stand still over Gibeon. O oh, moon, over the valley of Ahijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Does that sound like greater power? Yeah. There has never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Pastor Wade had a revelation this morning. Though this book says, or this passage says, there's never been a day like it before or since, we're here to tell you this morning, yes, today is this kind of day where God is doing the impossible. Where God is displaying His greater power within us. Because we are standing with Him he is fighting for us. We're putting our hearts in right alignment because greater power is with us when we are with Him. Are y'all with Him, church? Yes. Are y'all raising a war cry this morning? Yes. I'm going to make sure you lose your voice by the end of this sermon because we're trying to erupt out of our souls a war cry. Get it? Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. See, do you understand? We, under, we know that the Lord caused the sun to stand still in the sky based on Joshua's words. Do you understand what that means in our context, though? That no matter what your circumstances say, God is stronger. He is greater than what you think become impossible impossibilities in your circumstances. He's not at all concerned with that. If it required the sun to stand still for you to win, he would do it. Yeah. The reason that that was a unique day is that's usually not what we need. We usually don't need the sun to stand still, but we still need that same greater power at work in our life. Look at 2 Kings 6 and verse 15. When the servant of the man of God, somebody say man of God. Man of God. Got up and went out early the next morning and an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Do you see these circumstances here? Oh my Lord, what shall we do? Says everyone in this church at some point, probably every day. Oh Lord, what am I going to do about this? Oh my Lord, what am I going to do? Come throw down. No. <laughs> Um, Amen. Sorry, I'm still stuck on that one. Verse 16. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Yeah. But that's not the way that it looks to the servant. Yeah. All he sees is an army surrounding him. And he sees him and his boss. That's it. He sees two people and an army. And the boss goes, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I got, I got a secret for you. See, you can't look at it from your natural eyes because those that are with us are way bigger, better, badder, and more than they're with them. Look at verse 17. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, <laughs> can you almost hear the, the silly boy? 
I, that's what I hear in this. Oh, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. Kind of like, you think we're in trouble? But we're surrounded by an army. <laughs> you think I'm in trouble? You think you're in trouble? Are you kidding me? Lord, just open his eyes. Come on, how many of us need to have our eyes open this morning? Yeah, yeah. Open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. Amen. And he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Yeah. See, what happened there is he changed his perspective. He found a tower and got elevated. He remembered that he was seated in the heavenly realms, that he had fullness in Christ, that God was with him, that his power was there. And so the servant was like, man, as long as we stay with him, he stands with us. As long as he is with us, he will help us. Yes. He will fight for us. There is a greater power with us than we could possibly imagine. Our requirement is that we stand where he tells us to stand. Amen. That we stand with him Amen. so that his greater power is manifest in us. Amen. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 20. We'll look at verse 17. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. What well, the Lord's command is to them is the same for us. Do you hear the command to take up your position? Stand in the division that I have ordained for you to be. Amen. When we get outside the boundaries of our division, we not only risk ourselves, but we risk the victory for all those that surround us. When we're standing in the right position, we are aligned with the armies of heaven. We have the power, the greater power of God at our disposal. And we only need to stand firm. Be immovable on the deep convictions of his standard. Don't deviate. Don't turn to the left. Do not turn to the right. But we're going to stand firm in the position that God has placed us. In doing so, we get to enjoy watching the deliverance the Lord our God will give us. Oh, his right hand is mighty. It is able to deliver us from every circumstance, every power. We just can't let our hearts become full of fear. We got to drive it out. Standing firm means that you are driving out fear on the inside. It means that you are lifting up your head and you're raising a war cry, calling on the name of your God who will deliver you because you are demonstrating faith by trusting in his greater power. Come on, Chris, raise your sword. The Lord is with you when you stand with him. You've got yes. all the power you need. You can handle any demonic force, whether it's from the state or from the people in your own ministry. Gabriel Harris, you got the Lord standing with you as yes. you stand with him. Yes. You can overcome Ibrahim, Zakari. The Lord is with you. You got to stand with him and he will stand with you. He will fight for you. Come on, Nick Rosales. I'm looking at that brother. Man, he has uh, maybe gotten in a skirmish uh, a time or two in his life. At least that's what I hear. Yeah. But what he's going to do is as he learns to stand with the Lord, the Lord's going to stand with him. The things that look impossible about his family, the things that look impossible yeah, inside yeah. of his heart, God is going to give him greater power. Yeah. He will be more than a yeah. conqueror in these areas. Yeah. Turn with me to Mark chapter 11. We're about to get something right up in here. Mark 11 in verse 22 says this, have faith in God. A shot. Yeah, you're, yeah you, you, just, you just felt exactly what I did. Come on, set aside the, the feeling that you need to have a theological degree before you can understand what God is saying to you. Have faith in God. <laughs> Come on now. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Uh-oh. Here it comes from Jesus himself. That's if anyone truth. says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that will that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. 
See, God is with us as we are with him. He will help us. He will fight for us. See, there's something that we got to understand, church. There's a fact that you need to just uh, come to terms with. You can't move a mountain. There's a fact. You cannot move a mountain. But the truth is, is exactly what this verse says. Yeah. See, there's a difference between fact that says, yeah, I can't move this mountain. It's stationary. It's permanent. It's too big. I can't do anything with it. But this word says, the truth is, I tell you the truth. You think Jesus is going to lie to you? Okay. The truth is, is that you can move the mountains of adversity in your life when you stand in the word and in the truth. When you have faithfulness and truth at your hand, as you stand with the Lord, you have a greater power than what any fact may determine for you. You may be having difficulty in a pregnancy. That may be a fact. But the truth is, is that God is going to overwhelm you and give you victory in this. Mm -hmm. You may be having difficulties at work. That may be a fact. But the truth is, is that when you stand with God, he stands with you. And there is a greater power that you have Amen. than any adversity. It may be a fact that you're in a situation that you don't like. But the truth is, if you believe in him, if you have faith in God, he will lead you through. He will allow you. He will make you. He will fight for you you and you will be victorious well we're gonna, we want to encourage and strengthen your hearts this morning with these comparisons of fact and truth a little over a year ago the Lord began to tell us and encourage us that we're going to be standing in a year of prosperity and the fact is is that we spent many years as a church fighting to have children in this house the truth is the greater power of the living God has given us an abundance of children overflowing we had to build out rooms knock out some more walls to make room for the abundant provision that god has given us and is a walking living display of his truth not giving our hearts way to fear of the fact when we begin to look at these these next couple of items that we're going to give you i want you to relate these to your own life i, I, I really i cannot help but think that i think two or two and a half years ago the fact was that during a resurrection Easter service, Damien Tamika's daughter, D'Angelia, dropped dead right back there. You know what the truth was? The truth was that Damien came down to the altar, began to cry out to the living God, and resurrection power filled her body. <laughs> Damien, he told me, he said, I can't do anything about this. I am powerless to face this fact. But he knew the truth that he ran to God. He would find a greater power and that power be a one of resurrection in life. She's sitting with here, here with us today because of that crying out, that war cry that was raised up. If it can happen for that situation, what else is there? What else is there uh, that we cannot overcome with a war cry? That we can't raise up our voice and overcome of the fact and depend on the truth of what God is giving us. Even all the way down to just a little boy that has five loaves and two fish. Right? And share a meal with, with a friend on the hillside in Israel. But what did God do with that fact? He displayed the truth of his miraculous and greater power. He fed 5,000 men. Men. Not counting women and children. Meaning feeding 5,000 men and their families, and you had some leftovers. Come on, leftovers. You had some land, yeah. You had 12 basketfuls of provision. What begins to happen when we face the truth and override the fact with God's greater power? We have provision that is overflowing. Come on, church. It may be a fact that iron cannot float. But the truth is, is Elisha prayed, and he proved differently. He, he prayed, and the axe head began to float. See, there's a fact. But there's a truth that we're trying to get you to realize today. Oh, there's a fact that is it, impo it is impossible to walk on water. I tried many times and failed every time. But you know what? Peter knew the truth. He knew the truth that when he fixed his eyes on the king of kings, that he could walk on water with his king. That's right. He said, watch this. I'm going to jump out this boat. I'm going to prove this truth and deny the fact. Amen. It may be a fact that you have to, to advance in this world, you have to exalt yourself. You have to sell yourself. You have to tell people that what you're doing. But the truth is, is to advance in the kingdom, you've got to become the servant of everyone around you. 
These are the facts versus the truth. Oh, the fact was that Lazarus was dead for four days. Right? Martha clung on to that fact. You know, where you been? It's been four days. We've been waiting on you. He stinketh. He stinketh, Lord. But Lord is stinketh. King James. But that wasn't the truth. The truth was that Jesus lifted up his voice. He raised a war cry. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. It doesn't matter how long this has been going on. I showed up. I'm here. And I'm going to win. Amen. There's a fact that we were looking at in 2 Chronicles 32 that Sennacherib has destroyed over 40 cities by this point in the Judea region, and now he's surrounding Jerusalem. But the truth is, is there a greater power with us than is with our enemies? There's a greater force at work. 1 John 4 says, you, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them. Somebody say, overcome them. Overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. See, from the beginning of Scripture, throughout, you have to get a hold of this truth. Quit looking at your facts and bowing down to the facts of your circumstances. Stand up in Christ. Stand where He is. He is the truth. You stand with Him and He will stand with you. He is greater in you than anything around you that you can possibly imagine. Let's turn back to 2 Chronicles 32 and continue. Come on, shout it. War cry whenever you get there. Verse 10, this is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. Uh Uh-oh, something's coming. On what are you basing your confidence? To taunt, to challenge. That you remain in Jerusalem under siege. Well, they were under siege. That was a fact, right? Right? He's on their doorstep. He has a history of conquering and crushing cities and towns. When Hezekiah says, The Lord our God will save us from the hand of the king of Assyria. He is misleading you to let you die of hunger and thirst. Wow, this is strangely familiar. You have brought us out in the desert to die. See, the lies of the enemy have never changed. They're aimed at presenting a case full of facts that are mixed with half-truths, and they do not acknowledge the truth of heaven. In fact, they are at war with the truth of heaven. You know what needs to die inside of us? Our self-righteousness. What needs to die inside of us is pride and fear and selfish ambition. When that dies inside of us, guess what? We begin to live and can rightly acknowledge and see the truth of heaven that exposes the lies that are embedded in the facts that the enemy is presenting us. We're going to raise a war cry that exposes the lies of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Hold your place there in 2 Chronicles because we're going to come back. But we want to show you a parallel passage that gives you a little bit more detail. Turn to Isaiah 37. And we're going to look at verse 14. Isaiah 37 last year is where we got our core for the whole year about it being a band of survivors. The band of survivors came from Hezekiah defeating Sennacherib. See, we are still back around. The Lord is still reminding us of these things. Isaiah 37 and verse 14 says this. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers. You know that letter. You know that letter? The one that documents the accusations against you? You know that letter that is the accusation from the enemy? You know that letter that kind of puts it in a succinct way? Where is your, where have you placed your confidence? And it gets delivered. He did not read it. He read it. Then he went up. Somebody say went up. Went up. To the temple. Where do you go when you get the letters of opposition in your life? When the enemy comes against you with lies. When those things are happening inside of you. And it's brought to you. It's presented to you in such an undeniable way. What do you do with it? Are you like Hezekiah? Do you go up to the temple of the Lord himself? And then you spread it out before him. Lord, do you see this? Lord, I know that you are a God of war. Do you see what's going on here? 
Are you, are you feeling me, Lord? This is bad news. This is a difficulty at work. I'm not playing. There's a fact that's involved here. Do you see this, Lord? He laid it bare before the Lord. Come on. We will do so much better to stop trying to find the facts, trying to rationalize our way through, to try to medicate ourselves into some form of feeling better about it. We will do so much better to say, Lord, do you see this? We know that you have truth, but here are the facts. And we present them to you. We lay it bare. This is actually the way it is. We're not going to lie to ourselves and say it's something different. This is what it is, but we're asking you to take a look at this, Lord. Because when you open our eyes, we can realize that we're the ones that are about to win. We can realize that the enemy should be afraid, not us. Verse 15, Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. What a novel thought. O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. What is he saying? Lord, you're on your Merkava. War chariot. You're in a war chariot. You are riding on the wings of these of these angels. Lord, you are standing there. O God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Somebody say, Lord, listen. Lord, listen to me. I'm I'm crying out to you, God. I'm asking that you hear my war cry here because we're in the midst of war, and I'm crying out to you. I need you to hear this, Lord. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Yeah, the problem isn't him needing to open his eyes. The problem is with us opening our eyes rightly, isn't it? Listen to all the words of this evil man that he sent to insult you, Lord. Hezekiah says, you know what? This is bad news. He's got a bigger, badder, stronger army than we got. But you know, I think it says in Deuteronomy that when we go to war and the enemy has more, that we're supposed to come and trust in the Lord our God, that he who is with us is more than what they have. And this is what he does, is he cries out to the Lord. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles 32. Let's see how this plays out. Shout war cry when you get there. Come on. We'll keep this thing elevating. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 20. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah. Wow. Wow. Uh-oh, King life. Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Come on, what begins to happen when I'm going up to the temple? I find other men of God who are wanting to raise a war cry alongside of me. I begin to spread it out. I lay it bare before the Lord, but I'm also laying it bare before my brothers. I begin to let my brothers know what I am struggling with. I'm not rolling it up and keeping it concealed. I am making it revealed before the God of all heavens and those that God has put around me. Transparency is what is going to bring us strength and give us victory. And when we begin to do this, we have our brothers next to us. It begins to play out with power. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven. You know what they were doing? They were raising a war cry. And as they raised that war cry, verse 21 says, And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated, who annihilated all the fighting men and the leaders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. What begins to happen when we spread out our troubles, the facts, before the Lord and before our brothers and sisters. We begin to then find the courage and find the stamina to raise up a war cry. And as a unified body, we're lifting our voice, and we are therefore able to expect the power of heavens to come in and annihilate what is opposing God. What do you need to raise your war cry about today? Is it shalom? Is it fear? Is it selfish ambition? Is it bad news that has descended upon your doorstep? Find 
a righteous man or woman of God to stand next to you. Spread it out before the Lord. Begin to lift up a war cry. And this is the best part. Expect the armies of heaven to move on your behalf. Amen. We do not do the name of Jesus or of our God justice if we begin to pray and we are not expecting the power of God to be displayed. We raise a war cry that is full of faith. It is full of confidence. It is the very thing that is going head to head and face to face with the very things that are taunting us. Because we know and we trust that the God who has saved us in the past is the same God who's going to save us now. And he's going to give us victory today, tomorrow, and for eternity. See, this is the God who caused the sun to stand still of the sky, and He's moving on God's people. He's moving on their behalf. He is fighting for them here. And one angel, everybody say one angel. One angel. Took care of 185,000 of the enemy's army. Wow. One. That's great. There are parallel passages that spell it out for you. 185,000 soldiers of the enemy killed by one angel. Y'all, we've got to, we've got to understand this today. Yeah. If one angel can kill 185,000 warriors in a single night, mm, 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 mm. and there are legions of angels that can help us, <laughs> and the angels aren't as, aren't anywhere close to being as strong as the God who sent them, what is it when we say God is with you? Yeah. Amen. When you stand with Him, what does it mean to have God with you? It means that we have no right to be afraid. It means yeah. that we have no right to lose. It means that we have no right to do anything yeah. but trust in this God. We can look at the mountain and say, get out of my way. Go Amen. into the sea. Because the God of all creation is with me. Amen. How do I know that? Because I'm standing with Him. Amen. I'm not asking Him to come my direction and come help me on my, on my uh, mission that I have made for myself. I'm finding where he is, and I'm standing. I'm planting my feet on the word and saying, I'm with you. Amen. And he'll say, yep, and I'm with you. Yep. I will empower you. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5. As we turn to our last few passages of scripture here. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. We want to show you something here. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, the risen Savior, the anointed Son of God, He who is now seated at the right hand of the Father. But we're talking now about during the days of Jesus' life on earth, in the fully human form of who He was, He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. Who does Jesus pray to? Dear me, I ask me to help me. He offered up prayers and petition with loud cries. He understood what we're talking about today. There's something passionate inside of our Savior who says, I'm going to cry out loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Oh my. What do you cry out to, church? Do you cry out to your own logic? Do you cry out to how you feel in the moment? Do you cry out to a friend? Do you cry out to your finances? What are you crying out to? Jesus showed us and he says, I will cry out with loud cries and tears if necessary to the one who can save me. Amen. Oh, pastor, we're not, we're not calling out to other, to other people. Are you sure? Huh, we only serve one God. Amen. This is a group of people who wants to do this right. And if you're not careful, what do you cry out to in your heart when difficulty comes? Are you crying out for there to be rest? Are you crying out for a little peace and quiet? Or are you crying out to the one who can actually save you from this thing? 
who can change the circumstances. He can stop the sun in the sky. He can show you that the angels are surrounding you with chariots of horses and fire. Who are you crying out to? And he was heard. Oh, Some might say, thank God he hears us. Thank God he hears us. He was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus was not over somewhere doing what he decided to do, asking God to leave his throne and come help him. He cried out with loud cries because he was reverently submitted to be exactly where God said to be. You want God's overwhelming power? You want God to come in and hear your prayers, the one who can actually save you? Then you must be reverently submitted to where he tells you to stand when he tells you to stand there. No matter the cost, no matter the price, no matter the pain, you stand where he tells you to stand and he stands with you to empower you, to save you from even death if necessary. This is what God is saying to us today. Quit being where you want to stand. Quit deciding to cry out in your own efforts, to cry out to your own remedies. Come stand where he tells you to stand and stand nowhere else. The idea that you can serve God anywhere is a ludicrous idea. You have one place that you can serve God, and that's exactly where he tells you to stand. Nowhere else, not even a little bit off, are you allowed to stand in. You stand where he tells you, and his resurrection power is with you. Amen? Amen. Church, when we begin to stand where he has told us to stand, it puts us in the position to have the power of the heavenly realms at work in our circumstances. This is saying to the one who could save him from death. right? The one thing that every human being fears that is not right with God. They fear death. If this is the way that our king demonstrated for us of how to access the power of heaven, that we are reaching up with a war cry, a loud cry, and even with tears, because not even death can overcome the power of God. That's the kind of trust that we have to resurrect within our own hearts and souls. But there's something unique that we found within this passage. The word loud in verse 7 of Hebrews 5. What we found is a definition for it. It's Strong's number 2478, and it means for the believer is God's power standing by, ready to unleash itself to bring about his preferred will through faith. This word loud means that there is a standing by of God's miraculous power that is ready to unleash itself to bring about his preferred will. What is God waiting on? He's waiting on your war cry. He's waiting on your passionate and desperate call for his name because he wants to display his glory. You have to raise your voice and go get it. We cannot sit by and throw ourselves a pity party and invite all of our friends to it. We have to take off the hat and take off all of the, the, the candor of a pity party and put on the garments of praise. Put on the war cry that says, Lord, you have the power to change this situation. I don't have the power, but you do. And it is standing by. It's ready to be unleashed from heaven. So as I begin to raise a war cry, I'm expecting the power of heaven to descend and move on my behalf because not even death can overcome the power of God. Come on, let's turn to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. We are speeding towards an end, but you need to keep what we're saying to you. Even Jesus had to learn and how to use a war cry. It's not just that he had volume. It's that he had the intensity of the heavens with him, and he was making a war cry to his father, the only one who could save him from death. Psalm 34 and verse 14. Turn from evil. And do good. Seek peace and pursue it. 
The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Yeah. Remember what First John said? Those who do what, are, what is right? Yeah, they're righteous. Yeah. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive Amen. to their war cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out. Yeah, they do. See, the Psalms here teaches us that. If you're going to be righteous, you've got to learn how to cry out. And the Lord hears them. Isn't that the fear? Yeah. That you're going to cry out and you're going to fail. You're going to cry out and really try and even be loud with it. But somehow, He's not going to come through for you. The righteous cry out, church. And the Lord hears you. He will deliver you from all of your trouble. Yeah. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. See, when you're in the battle, He's listening. When you're having difficulty, He's listening. When you're worried, He's listening. You can't just go to somewhere else, though. You've got to come and stand where He tells you to stand and cry out to Him. The righteous will cry out, and He will hear you. He is close to the brokenhearted, and He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Those who understand that they can't fix it, that they don't have the strength. But Lord, we want that greater strength to be inside of us. We want that greater strength to be working through us. We need that greater strength to be fighting for us. We want to fight, Lord. We hear that we're in a battle. But my God, we need you to help us. My God, we need your strength above all else. Would you help us, Lord? We are crying out to you that we might be empowered and be victorious in this day. Let's turn to Isaiah 42, 13. Say war cry when you get there. Oh, say it loud. The Lord will march out like a champion. Does that sound like a victorious king? Oh, it's one thing to win, win just a blue ribbon at a baking contest. It's another to march out like a champion who has triumphed. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. But what kind of God are we following? We're for following a God who's at war, but not just at war, but a God who is triumphant. A God who is victorious, who is faithful, and he's true. With a whisper, he will raise the battle cry. With a slightly elevated tone. With a what, church? With a shout, he will raise the battle cry. If this is how God acts, how should we act? Come on, this, this is the spirit of the king that we have aligned ourselves with, that we have surrendered lordship of our own life to. Why? Because He is a God who stirs up His own zeal. He is a God who shouts and will raise a battle cry. So what are you going to do? This is one of those mornings where we're not going to drown in the pit of despondency and despair. You got problems? Welcome to the club. You got difficulties? Congratulations! It's through many trials and hardships that we enter the kingdom. But that's not where my focus is. My focus is on how great my God is. This morning we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to tell our problems how great our God is. We're going to raise a war cry in the house of God. Mighty King, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus for your power. We thank you for your victory. We thank you for your battle plan. We thank you for your triumphant power within us. We say in the name of Jesus, we will win. We will win. We will win. We will win in the name of Jesus. Come on.